Thank you, and uh, welcome to this September's meeting of the NHS Devon uh, Board, and uh, really welcome to everybody who's following from outside as well. So just to start the meeting, um, just want to note that we don't have any apologies, um, and I'd just like to ask colleagues if they wish to update anything on the um, interests and operations of interests at all. No? That's great. And then we're just going to look at the um, issue of the previous meeting and minutes. Does anyone have anything that they want to update around the minutes of the last meeting? Yes. Okay. Can I uh, propose slight rewording around the statement that we approve the appointment of auditors? I think we actually um, approved the audit committee to progress appointment. Mm -hmm. That would be a, a clarification. Thank you very much for that, Graham. So, um, Jodie, if you would take that forward to update the minutes, that would be great. So, um, and we have no open actions from our, our last meeting either. So, we're going to come on to the next item, which is the signing off of the CCG annual report. Now, this is um, a formal process that it allows for the publication of the, um, of the annual report, uh, but it has already been approved by previous meetings of the CCG. So does anyone have any comments that they would like to, to make on the annual report? No? Thank you. So um, we've just clarified that will now be available to the public. So uh, just moving on to the next section, what we would normally have as our next section is um, a member of the public sharing their experience. And we're very grateful that uh, that Mrs. Gay Duran is going to be sharing her experience, but she'll be joining us shortly. So I think what we'll do is in the meantime, we will move on to the next item and then we'll come back because I think um, the, the next item on the agenda is actually the chair's report. And, uh, and that I'm going to take as read, but there are just a few areas that I would like to highlight um, with your permission. And the first is to extend my thanks to everybody that has been involved with the appointment of all the members of not just this board, but also um, of the One Devon Partnership Board. And I'm, I'm pleased to report that all of both of those boards are now fully complete. And, and, and I'm really grateful to everybody that's giving their time and their expertise, both to this committee and to the One Devon Partnership. I'm also very pleased that uh, Councillor James McInnes is joining us, who is with me, the co-chair of the One Devon Partnership Board, will also be uh, making some comments shortly as well. Um, one thing that, uh, that Councillor McInnes and I... Uh, about was that we should be focusing on the impact of the cost of living um, across our health system. And, um, and although we are keen that we shouldn't be duplicating the work that is already taking place in councils and um, across the voluntary sector, what we felt is that it would be important that we try and bring together what is happening to try and look at the impact on our health system um, and, and the wider system across Devon of the, of the impact of the cost of living on, on communities. And uh, we've had a number of discussions earlier today as a board in our development session about the potential impact of that. So we should be acting as a forum to bring together analysis where we are. And I'm grateful to all the directors of public health across the system for, for leading on that piece of work that, that we'll be doing. Um, and bringing together, as I say, what's already taking place, but importantly, to identify where there are gaps um, and also to share best practice across the system. Um, and, and I know that James will probably want to say a few words in his report about how we're taking that forward, but we're hoping to be able to start that process in October. And then I think the other point I'd like to uh, draw out from my chair's report is, is our gratitude for some of the really good work that's been happening across the system in the most challenging of circumstances. And, and I can see that uh, Mrs. Gay Duran has joined us now. Thank you very much for agreeing to share your story with us shortly, because it is one of the areas that I did want to highlight, that although as a system, Devon has extraordinarily um, high number of people who are waiting more than two years for care, um, what we are seeing is that now Devon is uh, nationally one of the leading systems for improving the performance in terms of tackling that backlog. Um, so I think what I'm going to do, unless anyone has any particular queries for me about, about my report, as I was going to bring um, Gay in now, and thank you very much, as I say, for joining us, 
to share your own experience of that because I think it is um, something that we, we are keen that we should highlight, not just the, the areas where we need to do better and we recognise that there are many of those, but also to acknowledge what is happening and extraordinary a hard work of our staff across the system. So um, does anyone have any questions for me first on my report? Are you happy for me to go over to, to Gabe? Right, so Gabe, thank you very much for joining us. And um, yeah, you're very welcome. Uh, we're, we're going to do a hand over to you to tell us a bit about your experience. Okay. Um, my name is Gay. Um, I'll be 66 next month. I was on the waiting list for about two years and four months um, for a hip replacement. Obviously, COVID hit. Everything had to be stalled for that point. Um, then um, I, got a, I got a call quite quickly. I went to see the consultant, a uh, very lovely man, and he said that, you know, it could be four to five months before I'm seen again. Um, but then it was amazing because from, from walking out, um, I got a phone call, which was about 10 minutes after that, to say, would I like to come in for my surgery on the Tuesday, the following Tuesday, which was incredible. I only had five days to think about it. So obviously five days um, that I didn't have to be scared of it because I didn't have long to think about it. It was a fantastic experience. Um, it was at the Nightingale Hospital and honestly, it was amazing. I, I, I can't I can't thank them enough for that. It was the the holistic bit. It was from start to finish, right from when I got the phone call from the um, the consultant secretary to say would I like to come in, all the way through getting the pre op assessment. All that had to be done very quickly, um, and obviously the COVID test and all that kind of thing. The Nightingale was amazing. I, I honestly I can't I can't rate that place enough because they were incredible. The whole I'm Ryan as well. Um, when I had my second hip done, um, I think I'm five weeks post-op for my second hip as well. And again, being, being offered um, my second hip replacement so soon after the first one was just, yeah, yeah, I feel very, I feel very grateful to have got them both done, at, you know, within sort of six months of each other. So, and again, with the, yeah, sorry. Um, again, with, sorry, but is someone trying to say something? No. Um, so again, with the Nightingale, fantastic. There was, you know, the, they've said, you know, sort of think about the negatives as well as the positives. And I actually can't think of any negatives. I really can't think of it because the staff-wise, um, facility-wise, it was fantastic. And to be able to get out, well, the first time I was able to get out um, that same evening, um, because I was later on the list on the second one, I had to stay in overnight. But again, that was absolutely fine. Um, so to be honest, there isn't any negatives. And it was, um, yes, it was it was quite an experience to have it at the Nightingale because it's so good that to think that it's actually been used well, thank you very much for that, and uh, and we hope that you're now feeling that it was all worth going through. Absolutely, absolutely, one hundred percent. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to hand over to colleagues if they have any questions or follow up points that they'd like to make. Yes, Judy. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm still finishing my lunch. Rude of me to be eating while you're talking. Apologies. Um, I just wondered how far away the Nightingale is from your home. And um, you... It's uh, so I live in Exmouth, and the Nightingale is in Exeter, so about fifteen miles away. Okay, and if yeah. somebody from a more distant part of Devon were being offered a place in Nightingale rather than their local hospital, because Nightingale has, as you said, some really nice, faci good facilities. <coughs> Would you encourage them to do that? Yes, 100%. Yes, definitely. Um, that my, second, my second operation was actually booked for RD&E in Exeter. 
Um, that had to be cancelled, unfortunately, the day before because an author uh, trauma came in. So obviously, somebody has to be cancelled for that. So, um, but then they offered me the Nightingale again four days after that one. So, and I was actually quite pleased that it was a Nightingale again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? No. Thank you. Hello, Gay. I'm Liz Dunford. I'm Chief Exec in Torbay. And it, oh, it's really hi. fascinating hi. Lis listening to stories about people having hip replacements and going home on the same day and how that really represents significant transformation. But I'm interested in that post, you know, when you got home, the, the level of support you needed and, and how that worked for you? Um, yeah, yeah. Abs yes, I think everything was fine. I mean, um, to, to, I was a bit worried getting out the same day. That that kind of did worry me, but it was needless. I didn't need to worry about it because they prepared me for being able to go home, to be able to do my stairs. Um, my stairs are a bit daunting because they're open plan. And um, <laughs> I think if the physios had seen my staircase, they might have been a bit worried, but it was fine. I was on crutches and I was fine. Um, I got a phone call. I got a follow-up phone call within 40 hours from one of the male nurses that I'd actually met at the Nightingale just to see how I was um, getting on and if there was anything that, that could help me with. So, yeah, the, that, that was good. Brilliant. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Andrew. Uh, thank you, Chair. And, uh, and thank you, Gay, for sharing your story both about being on the waiting list for some time and uh, and um, your treatment at the Nightingale. I was just going to ask Gay, given um, we've been looking at um, perhaps what information we provide to people who are on long waiting lists, is there anything that you felt would have been helpful for you to know or to have had from uh, the NHS during that sort of waiting period? Um. Well, I think because because it was exceptional, it, because of the COVID, it was exceptional. So everyone knew that everything was going to be delayed so much longer than it would have been. And um, I think I don't think there's any advice I can actually give because I think everybody just has to be patient. And I just like I say, I felt very grateful that I'd been given the chance to have both my hips done. Um, um, so I would just I would just say to people you have you have to be patient you have to just wait your turn. Uh, I've had a couple of negative responses from people that I've met in the street to say um, I can't believe you've had the second one done so quickly. It must be because you work for the NHS. And I said, well, actually, no, because my consultant didn't know I worked for the NHS, and she was quite she was a bit negative towards me thinking that I'd kind of jumped the queue and it, you know, it left me with a little bit of a bad feeling there. So, um, yeah, yeah. And, and she wasn't even waiting for an operation. <laughs> so, um, but I don't, I don't think there's any advice I can give them It's just, just be patient and it, it will happen. Um, and just be grateful we have got the NHS. Thank you. Gail. Thank you. Well, um, and Tandy, our, uh, would like to ask a question. Yeah, just what you've explained. Thank you very much for coming back with such good feedback. It's really nice to hear some good stories. But just picking up on the last point you've just made there, I'm just wondering whether, um, because you work for the NHS, you understand the system better. And so you're able to um, see why certain things are done in a particular way. Do you think that that's probably where we should be putting a little bit more time in terms of explaining to the public who might otherwise not have the same level of um, yes, yes, insight um, yes. as you do? Yes, I think I think you're right there. Yes, I, I do sort of have a, a you know, good idea how things do work in the NHS. Um, so, so, yes, I think your, your point is right. Maybe, maybe there there needs to be a, a bit of a different approach to just just to let them know how much. I mean, the the, the media is always you know saying how how pushed the NHS it is, but I don't think I don't think Joe public really know how bad it is there. Thank you. And, and final question from 
from me, if I may go, is how good did you think the information was that you were sent home with that could advise you about what you should and shouldn't be doing um, over the weeks after your surgery? Yeah, the, 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 the first time I didn't get, I only got a sort of um, leaf, it wasn't even a leaflet, it was just a, a sort of exercise sheet. Um, but the second time, and uh, bear in mind, they'd only been open three weeks to, to do hips and knees. Um, but the second time, I was given a proper booklet with everything in it. So everything was explained. And I still keep going back to it, looking, thinking, oh, am I doing this a bit too quickly? And um, so I still keep going back onto the booklet and rereading it. And yeah, yeah. So, yeah, very helpful. All that was very, very helpful. I think the one thing that I, I, I did mean to mention was with the nightingale, um, other people have said to me, obviously I, I knew where it was because it, I knew it was in the old home base. Um, but a few people that have had to go there said that the signage isn't very good. They, they've, they've not been able to find it so easily because the signage. And again, maybe because it's only been open, you know, to the public for so many months now but um yeah they, they have commented about the signage um for, for approaching it and then the town north down to it and then the main entrance because obviously you have to go through security gates to get in there but the signage isn't 100 percent good thank you for that and did you feel confident that you would be able to contact someone if you experienced a problem after your surgery yes you yeah I, um, there, there was about three different options in that leaflet to get in touch if there was any problems. Thank you very much. Do we have any other comments or questions? Well, really grateful to you, um, Gabe, for sharing your experience with us today. And I'm so glad that it was such a positive experience for you and uh, very best wishes for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you taking the time. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. So, yes, I think, it, I think it is really important to hear the positives uh, as, as well. Um, but I think coming back to Tandy's point about some of the health inequalities, which is also very much part of our remit going forward and, uh, and again, again has been in the news recently, I just wonder whether, Jane, when you're giving your report, you could also comment on um, what is being done to check that we're not leaving some groups of our communities disadvantaged if they're not able to access our systems. I can pick it up there. Thank you. Yeah, I, would mean, be I, I, would, I would say that through the planned care board, which is our Tracy <laughs> chairs, I know that that's been a question um, of consideration, but in fact there is a piece of work that is uh, being undertaken at the moment um, with UHP and the Plymouth system, um, particularly working um, sort of using a, uh, a sort of framework or a sort of an approach which does specifically drill down to ensure that the health inequalities of people with learning disabilities and mental health uh, are being picked up. So that's um, a small piece of work at the moment, but with the view that we would look to um, roll that out. Um, Across across the whole patch, and that um, that's being developed in partnership with Optum. But in fact, the person who's leading it is a is a is a local mm. GP um, who um, has developed this framework to make sure that we're using the linked data sets to ensure we've got that correlation. So so I think um, you know I, I think we'll be really uh, positive. But I know that the health inequalities has been has been part of the health has been part of the plan care board. Um, but I think with this um, linked data set work, that would be easier to be more uh, rigorous about it. So we'll be able to see retrospectively that we're not widening inequalities, but are we also having a proactive approach to contacting people who could benefit from facilities like the Nightingale? Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so, so yes, but happy again to get um, some assurance to the board around that. I was just going to mention the work that um, a GP Claire Hooper had led um, coming out of um, COVID around inequalities and the, the long wait and um, a quite comprehensive um, report that she produced again, which I'm happy to, to share. Thank you. Anyone else have any follow-up points or questions? 
following so just be clear about the action then so you'd like uh, yes. an update to the board about the work that's undertaken for the sake of that yes I think inequality is not just for facilities like the Nightingale, but also the issues that have been highlighted around access to cancer <coughs> care as well. But, <coughs> thank you. Oh, thank you, Jane. I think it's your report. Oh, just, I'm sorry, Sheila. Follow up with your report um, around the, the cost of living crisis. Yes. Um, and it strikes me as that as an addition to our, our citizens, that our workforce is going to really struggle with this because we're, we're in a very high um, house price. So, mm -hmm. um, with, with wages that aren't catching up, and I, I do think that this sort of possibly be part of our strategic thinking about whether or not this is going to affect recruitment and retention in this particular area, and also whether there are some imaginative things that we can do. Um, so, I know in Cornwall they're piloting something called Home Share, where um, sort of healthcare, health and care workers can share at home of an older person. They usually only average age is over 75, actually. So there's a sort of two-way benefit for the older person to have someone there who might help with basic tasks, but also particularly for people coming from abroad, they've got a way of getting settled in. But, um, and I know it's yet more capital investment, but I do think we might want to do some sort of uh, scanning to see how much of an issue housing costs are for our staff, whether or not that's contributing to some of our workload pressures and whether or not it's a case of working out whether there are capital written to their name or to be doing to support that. Thank you, Shane. Thank you. Thank you. Trigger my, my thoughts on two things. One is around, you, you're right, you know, most people in poverty are in work, and some of those will work for our services. Uh, and so there's, there's something about, about where do we, as our duty of care, support our individuals who are struggling. And I've heard a couple of times, not in this room, but from other colleagues who say, well, we'd refer them to the CAB, for example, for debt advice. And I've come back and said, are you confident the CAB have the capacity to deal with potentially increasing referrals? Because the answer is, is no, they're not. The feedback I'm getting is they are losing many of the volunteers because they now have to go to work to get the money rather than volunteer. And, uh, and so collectively as a system, how are we ensuring that if that is a response, not unreasonable, for our members of staff, how do we know they're not going to fall over as well? So that's a question, maybe from the ICP uh, summit might be something to pick that up. Um, but I guess the other thing as well is is how we operate, and you know, and I use it just as an example. But living in rural communities, um, you know, our our care and health staff retrospectively putting their petrol expenses on a diesel expenses at the end of the month, you know, without stating the obvious, but maybe that's going to be two, three, four hundred pound potentially. And we have they have to wait for that. And for some that might be the straw that breaks the camel's back. So how are we thinking differently around well for the last 12 months you put in three hundred pounds? What what do we look like in December and January? Can we do something that says you're gonna spend three hundred pounds, let's give the money up front? It's things like that, I think, thinking a bit outside the box, which might just help us reduce the risk of an increased crisis over the coming months. But yeah, thanks for you triggered by thought processes. Thank you. Jane. Um, well, I don't know whether um, Councillor McInnes would like to pick it up when he does his update for the ICP, but certainly um, uh, a couple of things going on. So I, I know that when we met the authority chief executives last week, colleagues, uh, we talked about, um, particularly in terms of preparation for winter in relation to that point about staffing. I think the, the scheme you've mentioned, Sheena, is already in place, or the thing that's at um, across um, um, Plymouth, Devon and Torbay, so just to reassure you that we are on it, but actually the intention is to use the opportunity of the partnership as a way also of bringing together the different people's um, good ideas, I think, in terms of our, uh, but also sharing of approaches that we can do, not just for our uh, our citizens, and but, uh, but for our voluntary sector organisations and also our staff, uh, as you've said. So, and I know uh, we've had some dialogue as well with uh, Director of Public Health about how we use the Marmot um, sort of report to help sort of shape that too. So, just so it's, it is a big focus at the moment. And I know individual uh, Plymouth, for example, is doing a lot in this space, but we just want to make sure that we are um, putting that, you know, we're starting to pull the threads together for our, as part of our winter plan. Thank you. James, did you want to respond to that, or or shall we leave this for when you're delivering? Well, your would you like me to leave it to when we do the um, ICP report, or would you like to, me to say something now? 
No, no, it was really in case you just wanted an immediate response because you had your hand up. And the immediate response is that I think that actually talking about staff is, is so important right across the system. And um, I'll mention it later um, about the idea of a cost of living summit. Um, but I think, you know, we really need to be looking at the effect on our staff right across the system, as well as the effect on the wider general public. And I think that the two need to be in tandem very importantly. Thank you for that. Great. So, Jane, I'm going to let you... Yes, and um, I also just want to give some feedback to a uh, member of the public who has been commenting on our patient story and understandably highlights why have we used a asks why have we used a positive patient story. And I'd just like to reassure you that in fact that at our last board meeting we did indeed hear from somebody who had had a very negative experience um, because I appreciate that's really important that we hear from people who haven't had a good experience of care or having difficulty accessing care in the first place, but would also like to acknowledge that our staff are working extraordinarily hard under very difficult conditions. And um, as a board, we also feel it's important to acknowledge what is being done that's positive. And this has been a really positive change. And so we wanted to, to take the opportunity to thank our staff working at the Nightingale. But we will uh, like to assure you in future boards, we will be hearing from people who haven't had positive experiences, and that will be the majority of the people that we hear from during our patient experiences. But thank you for that, um, Jane. Right, okay, thank you, thank you, Chair. So I will um, just pick out a few highlights from the um, my report. Uh, so, in fact, the segue is into the, in, into winter planning, and uh, also later on the report, it also. Uh, highlights the um, the timelines that we're working towards currently uh, through the system um, delivery and improvement group, which is a subgroup um, of the integrated care system exec team. But essentially, um, we um, we will be bringing back to the board in October um, our overarching uh, winter plan. But we are in the process of submitting against the the current uh, key areas. But we do expect an announcement. Uh, later this week um, on, on, a, on further information uh, nationally about the winter approach. Um, uh, and as part of that is, uh, you know, utilising some resources for demand capacity, but particularly looking at what the uh, capacity within the community. So you see reference there to virtual wards, but actually also um, how, how we've also, uh, I suppose, look to ensure we're maximising our, you know, our precious workforce as well as our services. Um, the other thing just to draw, draw people's attention to is that our new 111 provider does um, start, I think, uh, next, week, next week, that's 26, 27th, um, and um, obviously working very closely with uh, the new service provider over the last number of months to ensure we have a seamless service as, as much as possible because that is a really key um, part of our uh, urgent and emergency care um, service um, provision. Um, there are there's an update um, in relation to some of our collaborative work, and again, just picking up the the link to uh, our acute services and sustainability program and the patient or the citizen story. Um, in the, the link there being about how we maximise uh, a joined up approach across all of our acute providers support for, for example, the delivery of elective care, and that's work in is in, in, in good progress. And then lastly, I just want to say, obviously, the uh, again, part of the winter planning process will be our vaccination program, not just for uh, COVID, but for flu as well, and that is well underway. So uh, I'll just take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. So then again, in relation to the uh, ICS um, executives group, and this is the one that basically um, has reports in from uh, the executive groups, which is the uh, executive finance group, quality and risk, um, who um, the alignment wasn't quite right with the report um, coming to today's board. Uh, but an update is there from the strategy transformation group, which is uh, chaired by Simon Tapley, uh, as well as, as I said previously, the uh, system delivery and improvement group, which bring around um, our uh, urgent care ambulance work as well as demand capacity 
And then, as I say, in relation to the collaborative work, um, I think there is a, um, Liz might want to pick it up, the executive lead for that is probably um, Liz Lanker, not Alison Williams. But to, to, fair to say that um, we have been establishing um, and putting in place, a, as I say, a, a stronger governance um, process so that we ensure we've got the flow from all the different um, components of the, you know, all the different subgroups, all the, um, so that the executive group holds a ring around that. Um, and so timing, you know, in terms of getting the timing right, in fact, the last meeting happened yesterday, I was actually wasn't there, uh, but um, a number of things such as the Better Care Fund um, um, and its sign-off was included in that meeting. So, um, so this is, I suppose, we're just in the process really of trying to get the alignment right and then get the right information coming to you as the board so you have assurance that a lot of this work is taking place and um, to the time. Thank you. Yes, Kevin. Can I just have a follow-up um, question, um, Jane, then, which, is a, which is around the board accountability for the winter plan. Um, and... Um, uh, and, and, and obviously, we're spending a large amount of money on this. As uh, in Simon uh, reported, at least twenty-three million pounds um, of the twenty-three point nine million of the allocation, and then the Better Care Fund, I think, is around two hundred million pounds that we're spending there. So it's, it's just broad oversight of that. Obviously, this is all happening at Estig. Um, when the plan comes to the October board, is that coming for approval alongside? The money that we're spending on it, so that we're clear that it's this board that is accountable for it, rather than a, an executive group. So I think in terms of the demand capacity plan, the reality has been the timeline's been quite short in terms to get that signed off. So we've used the ICS chief exec or the executive committee to, to do that. So, um, in relation to better care fund, um, again, we have to make the recommendations to region. I think it's region who's already involved. Um, so, but uh, you know, again, part part of this is, as we're learning by doing, is 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 to say testing that out. Um, um, but I don't know if Simon did you want to pick that because yeah. I think I think it's a it's a fair challenge and one we will need to just uh, ensure we have got that. Yeah, no, so, I, so I had a very brief chat with Kevin um, at lunchtime. I think um, I think it would not be unreasonable for us to set out um, the basis by which we. Um, looked at the allocation around the 23.9 uh, million and how we intend to monitor and escalate um, where things are either going well or, or or not and I think that would be again appropriate for uh, uh, for the board to have uh, some oversight on. In terms of better care fund, the, you're right around region needing to sign off but it needs both health and local authority sign off. The local authorities are all slightly different in how um, they reach that um, uh, that decision around the sign off. So I think um, DCC goes through um, over you and scrutiny. I think Torbayer's delegation authority to the chief exec and think, um, and that goes, I can't remember if it goes through cabinet, but it, it certainly goes through one of the more formal, uh, formal groups. And we've not probably quite found, as you said, Jane, the right route for sign off through health because we don't go through all the sovereign boards um, in terms of the NHS. We hold that accountability at IC, uh, ICB uh, levels, I think, finding the right route for that sign-off. Um, a lot of it is um, already committed. Um, so when we when we go through the BCF, um, you know, we should do that under a development session or something, because there is a lot of detail in there and, uh, and not quite as much um, flexibility as we might, we might think. But I think it, you know, it is a lot of money, and, and we should have the right decision-making route um, for that. For expediency's sake, as you've said, Jane, we took it through um, ICS Exec, um, along with conversations with uh, other colleagues and engagement through the through the process. But it would be helpful to understand um, what we did the right decision-making route. Is. I, I want us to um, just be assured, I think, that we're following our own standing orders and standing financial instructions in the, I mean, I know Better Care Fund is, is, a, is a, a different issue probably, but the, you know, £24 million is a lot of money and the decisions are being taken as an executive group and I don't think that our supply is allowed for that, so I think it does need to come into here for approval, is what I would, 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 would suggest, unless someone wants to tell me that we have complied. 
Well, that's yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll take that back. And um, I mean, I mean, to some extent, it's, it's a really fair challenge. It, it, this is to some extent, um, you know, the, the national uh, requirements to um, to do this at pace has, has, has probably not helped us in any way. Fully, but, fully but, understand that. Pace. We think, don't want to delay it. No, no, but I think it's. I think we do need to take the opportunity to use our colleagues like yourself to help us just to make sure we have done everything that we need to. Um, yes, I think uh, uh, coming back to what I think it would be helpful as well to know how that money is being spent because I'm always slightly concerned whether uh, where you have staff who are not employed, rates go up and you don't actually buy the capacity that you think you are with that extra money. So I think it would be helpful to have some sort of analysis of where you think that's going to be best best spent to get value for money. I'm absolutely happy to set that out and how we want to set that on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Sheen, when it, you, was yours an entirely different point? Because I had a follow-up question on how the money is spent. Is yours on that issue it's as really well? It's really, but it's not on the money, so you go ahead. Yes, because um, one of the challenges we often hear is from the voluntary sector who feel that they're not sufficiently involved and, and they will very often deliver very good value for money. Um, and with the cost of living crisis, we, we've been hearing about how some of them are particularly vulnerable this winter. Um, how confident are you that we are sufficiently involving them in discussions about best use of this funding? Um, fairly. Is that, a, is that a good rating? <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is something that so we, we, do so we, are, we are in discussion with the yes. um, voluntary sector around. So, as you, I know Nigel um, whizzed up the slide uh, earlier, I've got it in front of me now. We have allocated to localities. Mm -hmm. um, a set of money, particularly around discharge, that totals just under £10 million. Um, the, 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 those discussions are being led by our locality directors who are jointly appointed to health and social care, and they have groups that involve the voluntary sector. Can I hand on heart say those voices are being heard um, as well as we would want them to be? I don't know because I've not asked the questions, but that's why I'm fairly confident they're involved. Yes. But let me go back and check. What the outcomes are. I, I mean, and we do now have a BCSE assembly that I think would be a useful forum for people to raise where they're not being involved by localities. Rather than I, I would just love to be... know very quickly, though, Sarah, yes. around that. So we, will, we will ask those questions, or I will ask those questions. Thank you, um, Sheila. Thanks, yes. Um, my question, I think, is coming more from an audit and risk perspective. Um, in the, I, I would see the role of an audit and risk, sorry, Graham, you might want to come here. Um, I would see the role of an audit and risk committee is to sort of identify our strategic risks and our, our approaches to mitigating those strategic risks, and also, I suppose, judging our risk appetite. I have very little idea about what's happening with regard to strategy and transformation. Um, so part of my question is about, about communication, and I'm guessing, actually, I'm, I'm going to move into governance as well. So I find it quite difficult actually to give assurance on some of the issues that we're being asked about because I literally have not got a clue what's going on um, or whether or not the, the risks that I think are the key risks are necessarily being mapped out and, and addressed. And I think that relates in a way to both governance mapping but maybe governance effectiveness. So I was just going to ask, you know, looking at the executive reports, and I know there's also a finance group and a quality and risk management group, and these presumably map on again so I'm not too sure about the strategy and transformation group, map on partly to, um, to, to the, the, the ICB committee structure, but also you've got a, a mental health and a, a, an acute you know, performance group. And I'm just, at, at what point do we sit and really look at this and say, is this working? Is this working as a system to bring together system thinking rather than siloed thinking across the piece? Because I, I just think it's a risk and I'm not too sure... Yeah, I'm not certainly getting the information I want to get, uh, but I don't know, maybe I'm just sitting on the wrong committees. And then another, another point related to that is there's absolutely nowhere that the health inequalities groups are, are, are being featured here. And, and, and I'm really worried they're going to be just a sort of add-on afterwards. We've had a conversation about this, and I think our feeling is that health inequalities ought to be part of every single committee structure. Um, and, and we shouldn't be concerned about acute backlogs, we should be concerned about the prevention side and things like that. But I'm just not seeing it here at all. So my, my questions are twofold. It's, it's partly about whether or not we're going to review this government structure and really question ourselves about whether it's working. Secondly, about the communication. Um, and, uh, am I alone in feeling I'm missing bits of information? Or, I mean, I, I could just be a bit 
been a bit dumb here. Um, but thirdly, related to the communication structure, I noticed that, for example, the subboards, the subcommittees, are meeting more often than this group is, which is totally opposite to what I've been used to. You know, most boards I sit on, where the main board would meet, would meet monthly, and the audit and risk committee would probably meet three months through. And so it's again, it's just a sort of slight confusion. So I'm 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 doing a innocent question. I'm a little bit confused. Sure. Well, I was going to say, we always agreed that we'd bake into uh, have a six month review of all our governance. Yes. And to be fair, yeah, we're in you know, month, month three almost. So before we, uh, and I do think that some of the issues is timing. Um, and of course, um, you know, people are, some, like you said, some people are, um, we just need to make sure through, through our other um, uh, the development sessions that we are getting those done so that people are getting up to speed and, and ensuring that that sort of communication is happening because we can't do it all through committees and the boards. So, um, don't get me wrong, I think there are some teething problems um, and, um, and I think there is a bit about learning. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I just want to reassure you that that is definitely the plan and part of, you know, part of the, these meetings as well as getting the feedback about um, you know what works what doesn't work how are we capturing the right you know, with information and to say uh, have we are we holding true to our sort of um, standing financial um, arrangements for example so um, but um, we've got to be realistic about what can we achieve in, you know um, so I think I think six month review is probably the right time to do that um, so that Simon, if you've had yeah, to well, well so, so more specific, I'd be really interested to hear what you think's missing um, in the report, Sheena, because I can change it and include um, more more items. So I was looking around the table as you were talking around um, communication. I'm not sure about strategy, what's happening, etc. And um, Liz is on the group, and Steve is on the group, and Tandy is on the group, and Darren is on the group, and Nigel is on the group, and I'm on the group. So there's a there's a there's a a good board inclusion in terms of the work we're we're doing. But we, like I say, I'd be really interested to understand what you, what else you would want in that space, and, and happy to add it. In terms of health inequalities, that reports through the exec um, strategy and transformation. We've got a forward planner, which we're working through. So, acute sustainability plan has been um, the primary care and community first strategies have been with some more work. Required, we have the mental health and learning disability one there yesterday. So, you've got the report here from a month ago. So, we've met again uh, since then. We're having something on children's services at the next uh, meeting. So, I think you know, we, as Jane said, it's a bit you know, we are getting into our rhythm. But what I, what I want to make sure that I'm doing in the report is covering the information that you want and require because if it's not, if it's not meeting the needs. I need Can to I just come back report. on that? Because I've had some really useful reports. I mean, this seems to me to be more of a, a, a terms of reference report rather than actually giving me any meet, anything meeting, really understanding what's going on. But I've certainly read the Community First Strategy. I've read the Digital Transformation Strategy. And obviously, I've read all the health inequality stuff. So I'm kind of keeping up with quite a lot of bits. But they're still bits of a piece. And the piece for me is a big system piece. And I know that there's going to be a different, difficult balance between giving us too much information but these strategies at the moment are incredibly important because we're right at the very beginning of this journey. And, you know, I, I just, I personally would like to be able to see the whole of the jigsaw, not just little bits of the jigsaw. I mean, not everybody has to read them all, but I, I would love to be able to have access to that. So, so I think, you know, we will be in that place where okay. we and Sarah and James are leading a piece of work around the health care strategy, which is the umbrella piece, isn't it? And then we have to do our five year joint forward plan by March, which is our response to the health and care strategy. So I think these things will start to yeah. mesh together, because I think doing them in silos, which we've done a little bit up till now, is missing that overarching umbrella piece. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I think it's going to be sit tight for a month or so. If it's not coming, if it's not coming to, to pass, then I think we've got some work to do. And I think because it's on Monday, we have our um, our check and challenge day, so a whole day looking at our operating model and structures. But this is very much a, a work in progress. So um, you know, it's very important that, that you feed back to us where you feel the gaps are so that we can make sure we've got them covered. Graham, I know you wanted to come in. Thank you. So um, I just wondered whether it's worth having this a call for calendar and a roadmap. What we expect when? 
because I think the, uh, the word pace is used a lot, isn't it? Um, what is that white speed? What, what should be a reasonable expectation? Because we've got operational pressures on the one hand, on the other hand, we will recognise we have to lay out a sustainable longer term strategy as well. But I think if we had a forward ex expectation of what happens when, when will we see these things? When will we do that governance review? And then agree whether that timeline is correct or not would be really, really helpful for us all. And then we'll stay with the same, same roadmap. Um, would it be helpful to put that as an action that we can then report back um, next time? So thank you. And, and also give some report back on, on the event on Monday, whether there are any other uh, gaps identified there. Thank you. Right. Oh, Andrew, apologies. Yeah, no, thank you, Chair. Um, just, just to add uh, three things, I think Jane um, and um, and Simon have said uh, quite a lot of response, but but I definitely do think we need to review um, the architecture. Uh, I think we obviously set it up fairly quickly, um, and it definitely needs refinement. And and if I reflect on some of the discussion yesterday at ICS executives. Um, there's still not clarity totally about where decisions are made. So so that bit does need refinement. So we'll we'll work on that. We've also had a really helpful session with Kevin, who's been really um, helpful um, in terms of um, really, I think, making some refinements to how the board works as well. Uh, what's on the agenda, how, how it flows between the board and the various committees, what goes to the various committees. And I also think third thing is, I think, Sheena, we probably utilise the um, catch up that you have with Sarah, uh, perhaps to address some of the things that you feel perhaps is missing in uh, as part of uh, your information. So we could probably make some use of that as well to make sure that you've got the right information that you feel you need. Thank you for that, Andrew. Does anyone else have any <coughs> comments at all on that? No? Right, so, so we're going to come next to uh, Councillor James McInnes. Thank you, James. Thank you, Chair. Well, like you said, um, you've got um, the report, our joint um, interim chair's report. Um, take it as read. Um, one or two updates um, in terms of the strategy, which um, the the ICP is duty bound to to have um, at least have the basics in place by um, December. That work is has started, and there was the first meeting was last week, and we've tried to get a broad section of people across the system on the strategy group um, to make sure that uh, the, the sort of various vo voices are there. Um, as a non NHS person, I thought it was important, for instance, to have. Um, some voices there from um, care providers um, to make sure that they they have input into it as well. Um, so we'll get an update um, at our next meeting on the 6th of October. So that works ongoing. As far as the summit is concerned, um, just a bit of background here. Sarah and I met, goodness me, it must be nearly a month ago now, just to have a bit of a catch up about things. And we both felt with the cost of living crisis, we need to find some sort of mechanism where we can actually bring together the response across the system. Now, I first want to say this is this must not be onerous because everybody is very busy and I understand there's a lot of work going on in a lot of different places. But from the integrated care partnership point of view, we really need to have a view of what is being done. And not only to have a sort of helicopter view, but also to see where there are gaps. Um, so it would help partners then to be able to see where some different work could be done in different places to try and fill those gaps. So um, I'd like to thank Andrew very much. He had a meeting with um, James Martin, a colleague of mine at the County Council, um, and they've started to put together a an outline of a plan about how we can go about this summit. Was We're thinking it would be online, um, and it really would be for sort of system leaders to come together and say what what you're doing in your Pacific area so we can actually bring together um, a map of what's happening. And then that can be used, as I've already said, um, to perhaps fill in gaps, etc. And I very much welcome your views because um, I'm hoping to take this to the Integrated Care Partnership on the 6th of October as an idea um, with a date which we haven't agreed on yet. Um, but any views welcome. 
Thank you. Well, we've already had a view expressed about the importance of understanding how this is impacting our workforce as well. Um, but were there any other um, comments uh, that people wanted to make sure were included, Tracy? Um, so I, th I think it's it's really helpful to understand what's happening. But I think I agree with James that it's going to be really important not to duplicate. Um, so there are um, conversations, conventions, uh, workshops happening in, in a variety of different places. So. I think there's something about this is probably um, a helicopter and coordinating role rather than asking people from similar organisations to come together and say the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I think that piece around the plan for the summit and what the benefits are going to be and what the product might be out of that. We start yeah. with what's, what's the end product. Um, so we hold, for instance, just for instance, from Plymouth City Council, up on our website, there's a cost of living with and what we're doing is collating every single thing we've got. Uh, UHP are using it, others are using it, um, just so that we've got one place where we're keeping everything. So something like that, that that works across the whole system might be sensible. I don't want to invent it here, but that point around absolutely understanding what people are doing and not asking them to come together to tell you, to tell us again what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Could I, could I just say, I take on Tracy's, Tracy's point, absolutely. Um, but I do think it's important. I mean, I know um, earlier on we were talking about making sure that everybody realises, you know, we are part of a system. We're duty bound to work together as a system. Um, and it, I think it really is the job of the partnership to actually try and bring that together in whatever way is as least onerous as possible, but I think as a cis whole system, we really do need to bring the elements together. So if someone from Mars came down and said, what's going on the in the ICS One Devon system, we could actually say, because at the moment we can say it in bits, but we can't say it collectively. And I think that's what's really important. It's really important also going forward to actually be able to say to our residents, well, what use is, you know, the, the ICS or what use is the partnership? Um, so we need to think we're not just about strategy, but we're actually about actually collectively working together and overseeing how both local government, the NHS, the community voluntary sector are working together for a sort of single product, as it were. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and I think one of our key purposes is to drive integration and to actually highlight where that isn't happening. So, for yeah. example, a question earlier about the voluntary sector, actually hearing from parts of our system who are crucial to delivery on, on what's not working for them. I think it's uh, really important that we give everyone a voice here. Gwen. Um, going back to a sort of timeline point, I guess, um, I, I think that, that the changes that have happened in the NHS and social care and the better alignment with, with local authorities has to deliver benefits at speed. And I think we just have to be really careful that we seem to be doing that and clear about what benefits will look like, that which I just fear as the years time people look cynically and say, what was the point of that? And people will disengage and we'll be back to where we were. I'm particularly worried over the winter period because I think those pressures, of which there are many, not least the fuel poverty, the cost of living crisis in general, pressures on the NHS, the possibility of, of, of the return of pandemic, etc., will push us to revert to type and do things that we used to do. Which comes back to my point about type, really lining up the expectations about what could we do when, what are those benefits, and are we very, very clear on how we're going to deliver those. And that's not to say we shouldn't think in the long term as well. <laughs> and that's the key thing we've got to do is both focus on short term delivery and long term sustainable solutions. If we get that, I'll be really happy. <laughs> Thank you. Sarah, right. um, Chair, could I just say one thing? And I, I didn't say it this morning, certainly because I know you were stretched for time in our workshop session when you talked about data, which I thought was a very good presentation. Um, I just want to ask the question, do we have data from the three local authorities without social care coming into the general data that comes to the ICS board? Because I really think that's important going forward to give an overall picture of what is happening across the system. 
Thank you. And it was highlighted that that is happening in some other parts of uh, the country. Yes. So perhaps I could ask um, Simon or Jane whether how we're confident here. you are that we're going to have access to that. So we've got access to some, James. I think it's it's fair to say, um, you know, because you'll have seen it as portfolio holder, the, the reams of data that you um, produce through Damien, um, Furness and others. Yeah. So, we have, um, so I think there are other things that we would we would benefit from having uh, access to and Kelvin and other colleagues are working together. I think the conversation Steve and I had earlier is about the outcomes framework, which we have pulled together. But some of that operational data that you're talking about, James, I think is probably still a bit too separate for our liking. Yeah, well, I think, could could I, could I suggest, Chair, that, um, you know, someone get, um, works on that because I think the sooner that we have high level data of what's happening in adult social care in the three local authorities, as well as looking what's happening in our acute hospitals, et cetera, will help marry together the partnership and, and the ICS because you'll be looking at um, information right across. Thank you. And I think having it presented in a similar format, the way that we're going to be seeing the NHS data presented, I think would be helpful too. Uh, I don't know, is the, is the business information team? So um, certainly um, Simon Chant uses Power BI, doesn't he? Um, Steve, uh, we'll have to take that away. So I don't think they all use Power BI. Yes. Um, Andrew wants to ask something at Sheena. Yeah, um, it's, it's not to us, um, Chair. It's just to say I totally support what James has mentioned. And indeed, um, James will know that's the approach that we're taking now um, with the overview and scrutiny committee. So rather than preparing just reports about health, for example, around winter, we prepare a sort of a, a sort of partnership uh, winter uh, approach that includes health and social care. So I, th I think that fits entirely with what James has suggested. Thank you. So shall we put that in action so that we're following that up and um, making sure that we're making progress on that? I don't know who would like to take that forward. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Sheila. It's actually on a related point to the data. I, 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 I don't know if it's happening, but I think we need to really expedite the um, application of the a, a, a trusted research environment status. Um, and, and I know there are gaps in the population health management records that, that you know, there, there, are, there are certain bits that aren't seen. We all know about various GPs aren't playing necessary, but, um, you know, not all the, is it the children's social care data and quite a lot of the, the bits, but also there are other bits of data which would be really, really helpful for modelling longitudinally, including things like the national pupil data set. So you can start looking at risk from early age and some of the risk factors that you know are likely to start determining. And we can start risk cross stratifying and getting in much earlier. So I would love it if we could really resource data. But the first thing is, is, is I think it needs more resources, but, but the first thing is a trusted resort for research environment status. Because at the moment, we can't get access to linked records. There are, they're there, but no one else can look at them other than the physicians. Um, would it would it be helpful for us to look at that in more detail at one of our development yeah, sessions? That'd be brilliant. Yeah, I think so. If we put that uh, as an action to to bring forward for one of those, thank you. It's a really important point. Right. I think um, if we have no more questions um, for James at this point, um, what we'll do is we're going to take a short break. We're a little bit ahead of our our time, but I think if if we could just have a five minute comfort break. And then we'll come back and, uh, and we'll be going over to John for the finance report. So.
So shall we um shall we get started um just before we go? We have to go back on lovely. Well thank you for rejoining us and, and just before we hear from John Dow for the finance report, um just to respond to a question we've had from the public about um about the cost of living impact on service users and their access to services. Yes, I, I'm I'm pretty clear that that will also be included in the work of the integrated partnership and thank you for that feedback. So John if you'd like to um, kick off with the finance report please. Okay thanks Chair. Uh, so um, finance report for the period to the end of July this year it starts on page 40 of the, of the pack. Um, th uh, throughout this report I'll be referring to the Devon ICS so this is the wider system the, the integrated care board as an organisation um, um, taking on from the CTG, um, which is also referred to in this report, which covered the first three months of the year. Um, but I'll generally be talking about the integrated care system as the wider system, the, uh, the ICB and the other statutory um, NHS bodies. Uh, so on page uh, 41 of the report, just to remind uh, in executive summary, we, we uh, submitted a plan for the year, which was a small deficit, £18.2 million pound deficit, uh, but acknowledging the um, requirement across the whole of the NHS to um, to, to deliver uh, break even. So we continue to work on, uh, on on plans to improve on that 18.2 if we can. But uh, the first priority is to deliver the plan uh, of an 18.2 million deficit. Um, a reminder there also that we're uh, for, for this financial year we're in a position where year on year the resources available to us will have reduced so significant increase in resources to the NHS as part of the COVID response uh, and although we are to some extent arguably through the sharp end of that the uh, ongoing impact of, of, um, of dealing with over the present world is, um, is, is obviously continues to impact on our services, but year on year reduction. So some of the financial challenge we faced is absolutely about how do we start to get costs back to reflect a more business as usual and funding as usual uh, environment. Uh, as part of achieving that, then the plan that we set us uh, an ambitious but, uh, but realistic efficiency savings requirement. Uh, of £138.9 million, pounds, which is uh, equivalent to about 4% of, uh, of the total of what we spend across um, across health services. So, so challenging, but, um, but but achievable and not out of line with what we've done in, um, in, in previous years. A reminder there also about, um, so, so we heard very powerfully from the patient story about um, efforts to get elective services back up and, uh, and, and running and increasing capacity uh, um, in ways including the Nightingale we've watched to do that. We do receive additional funding uh, outside of our main allocation to achieve that, which brings <coughs> with it both upside and downside financial risk. So if we can do better than the um, target of 104% output in comparison to pre-COVID period, we can earn additional funding beyond the, um, the, the money that we receive and our plan does make a, an assumption about that. Um, equally, if we don't get to the 104%, there's a risk that some of that money will be clawed back. So there is some financial risk associated with that, which is reflected in the risk assessment, which I'll talk about as part of this report. Uh, so um, the summary then headlines at, at month four would be that against that uh, plan that we've set, we are uh, reporting a break-even position, uh, so in line with plan for the year to date, which was a, a, a year to date deficit of 9.6 million. Uh, and the forecast position is that we will deliver, as I've said, against the deficit plan of 18.2 million that we set. Um, 
there is, however, significant uh, financial risk uh, and issues that we're having to manage in making that assessment that we can still uh, deliver to plan and significant amount of action that we will need to take to uh, secure that position. Uh, so on page 51 of the report, uh, we can uh, just get into that in a little bit more detail. Could you also say what page it is of your report? Because for those of the <coughs> board packs, we're just looking at your individual report. Yes. I would love to be able to do that, Chair, but I don't think my report is numbered in pages. So I'll, I'll, I'll count those lines and make fun. I think it's 12 of the, uh, of, of the board back. Can I ask a basic factual question before you move on just about the data? Is that okay? Of course. Just in light of the making data count discussion today, if you put these deficits into historical context within those process, whatever they call them, boundaries, mm -hmm. would we be floating along like this? which would suggest there's not a lot one can do. If you're sort of up and down the bar that you... you know, um, so I do know what you mean, yes. Uh, so my assessment of that would be that it, it, you would have the same issue as um, we heard about earlier on today in terms of the COVID noise. Yeah. So so, so we've, we've had two years that you'd almost have to discount. The years prior to that would be showing a consistent deterioration uh, in, in the position. So, so what we're faced with now is both arresting that deterioration and trying to, to try to get back. There would be also a danger in focusing just on the surplus deficit position, which to be fair, this report does focus a lot on because that is a performance measure that we're judged on. But the surplus deficit is a product of both the allocation on the one hand and the spend on the other hand, and there's been quite a lot of change to the allocation. Um, the, the inference of, of your question, I think, well, what was there's nothing we can do about it. I think I would challenge very strongly the notion that there's uh, there's, there's nothing we can do about it. But but the numbers don't stand in isolation. They're a product of the of the service. Um, so ju just back to um, back to risk then. So again, just to to, to repeat. Um, Forecast position is that we will deliver the plan. So that's the uh, the first column on this table, the 18.2 million just short of um, uh, deficit on the left hand side. The the the, the risks to um, delivery of that position or the action that we will need to take to um, to, to remove those risks are a significant risk of shortfall. So the, the biggest single issue for us is, is the risk of shortfall against the CIP programme that we set at the beginning of the year. So the 138 million that I referred to in the exact summary, there is um, a, a, a significant shortfall, significant further work to do to secure delivery of, uh, of, of those plans. And the table sort of shows how that falls by organisation. Uh, our response to that is to continue to drive through the organisational lines delivery of those plans, but also to look at opportunities across the system where collaborative working can deliver a, a, a better product and, a, and a, a bigger contribution to those plans. But, but a significant risk of shortfall on uh, CIP at the moment, although we continue to, to, to work on improving that position. Uh, the uh, other risks, so, so um, these will be things that have um, uh, uh, have come to light since the point that the plan was set. So the most material issue in, uh, in, in here will be the ongoing um, uh, impact of energy prices. That's sort of apparent for, for everybody. Um, and um, 
pressure on on care costs of of, um, of, of, of a variety of, uh, of of kinds. So we're recognising some uh, some additional cost pressure that has not all materialised yet. So the opportunity still exists to mitigate that and to ensure that it doesn't crystallise uh, as a risk. Uh, the mitigation column picks up where we've got. Um, either slightly fortuitous or, or um, other forms of non-recurrent action that we can take to deal with some of this financial pressure. But the point which is very evident is these are these are one-off measures that we're able to take. So there is an issue um, about how the, the, the 138 million of savings we need all need to be recurrent. We can do things in years mitigating the shortfall, but on, on a full year basis they will need to be recurrent. Excuse me, then the last thing acknowledged on this slide is the, the, the risk associated with uh, the elective performance and we either don't fully achieve our ambition around an additional money through that um, funding source or conversely we have something um, clawed back if we don't achieve performance so we're recognising just short of 11 million of potential risk associated with that. Uh, just. Finally, before I open up for questions, uh, on page 54 of the report, which is the, the, the slide headed conclusions and next steps for the uh, for, for the board pack, um, uh, just pulling out the, the uh, most material risk which I've talked about, the CIP risk uh, and the, uh, the ESRF and what we're doing about that. But just a few words then about the uh, financial recovery plan, uh, which um, consists of 14 work streams, which are set out uh, again in this report. I won't go through each of the work streams, but again, just to re-emphasize the, uh, the intention of these programs is, is that they are picking up areas of work which require cross-system collaboration and will supplement and enhance the delivery of savings in individual organisations. So this is not something that is completely disconnected and uh, will um, be making savings in its own right. It's contributing to the ability to organisations to deliver the plans that they have each set and hold responsibility for. Uh, that's all I need to say for introduction, Chair, but um, we'll open up for questions. Um, Kevin and Greg. Thanks, Eric. First of all, I just wanted to say thank John and his team for this new format of report, which I think is very, very, you know, sets out a very, very complex um, issue very, very clearly, really, in terms of the, the impact on us. So thanks for all of the work that's been done on that. Um, Sheena's great question just then uh, triggered. Um, uh, just something in me actually um, which I think might be part of a response to that which is um, if we if, if these risks materialised and we did have a deficit beyond 18 million um, at the end of the year um, it doesn't just get written off does it um, there is an implication of that as we go into future years even if it's only a cash implication in the, in the trusts, because I guess that's where it would, would hit in the, in the trusts, isn't it? But I just wonder if you wanted to say something about that. I mean, we, we always talk about one year at a time, don't we? Whereas actually one year impacts on the next one very, very materially if we if we don't hit the targets, doesn't it? It, it does, absolutely. Um, so so any, any, any deficit will be carried forward and will need to be repaid at, uh, at, at some point. And particularly for the Integrated Care Board, uh, the, the statutory organisation for the Integrated Care Board, there is the issue of accumulated deficit in the forerunner organisation where the expectation is if we can um, deliver balance for uh, for two years within the Integrated Care Board, then that debt will be set aside and, and, and written off. So that there is um, a, a, a some jeopardy um, to, to that if we can't deliver as, a, as an integrated care board, which we need to think about. But but wherever the deficit manifests in the system, it will need to be repaid at, mm -hmm. uh, at some point. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I too like to build on, uh, I think, Shina, your, your, your point, which is we're looking at a snapshot of year to date, although it's actually four months, even actually in reality beyond, beyond that. We're not seeing, as it were, the trends. And we're certainly not seeing the forecast about the calendarisation 
from here to the end of the year and beyond. Um, and I think what we're seeing here is that thus far, actual and plan is reasonably aligned, and therefore I deduce, given the SIP saving scale, it's all backloaded. So I'm assuming that if we look to the calendarization, we're currently assuming that we're going to, in, going to continue to track against plan, even though that's going to become more and more demanding. And I, I for one, think that is where the risk all lies. And in particular, what I'm worried about is that decisions are made either explicitly or more likely implicitly to try and get the money to work, and it does something awful to the system. And I actually think we owe it to this county that at some point we actually do take stock of where we think that finance is going to go and really, really look deeply and say, are, are we really going to hit that number or not? And I'm back to my previous theme that what I wouldn't want to suddenly see is that number jumping by tens of billions in one go. We should be on top of understanding our own expectations of outcomes and making decisions to achieve it, not, not suddenly finding leaps and bounds of bad, bad things going on. So I think I'm advocating a review point, and I know I know the Finance Committee will be on top of that, but uh, I think you should come to board in due course as well, about mid-year. May, may I just say one other thing on, on this? Because there's, there's a bit of context here as well, I think. And, and I, I th um, uh, what you said in your presentation of the report, John, um, that uh, you know the, um, the savings plan that we have is 4% of our 2.4 billion pounds of income. Puts it in a bit of context, actually, um, particularly as we're looking at this over, over a number of years, probably in terms of, uh, in terms of eradicating that. And we do tend to talk this up a bit sometimes in terms, because we're looking at it in terms of 90 million pounds. Um, but, um, you know, when you talk about it in terms of 4%, you can start to see a path through over a period of time, can't you? So it's important to keep the context in, in this, and that percentage um, did that, I think. So thank you. Thank you, Jean. Oh, it's a big problem, Jean. Okay. Um, sorry, going right back, John, to the executive summary, the very first page. Um, and the first point says we submitted a deficit plan of 18.2, but there is a requirement that the system achieves break-even by year-end. So my understanding is that we have accepted that requirement, which means our plan is for zero uh, deficit. I know it never works out exactly like that. But then we move down at the bottom of that page to say the reported forecast is a deficit of 18.2, which delivers to plan, but it doesn't. It delivers to the first statement we made about what we thought we might be able to do, but I understand we've committed to this break-even point. And it, so I suppose my point is just a little bit about language, because it's very comforting. You know, I say, oh, well, it delivers to plan, but actually, which is the plan? Zero? or 18.2 deficit in terms of how we judge how well we've done against it at the end of the year. Yeah, thank you. So it, it is an, an important distinction, but um, absolutely clear, the plan is 18.2 deficit, and first responsibility is to deliver the plan. The expectation, open brackets, of NHS England, close brackets, uh, is that we get to break even best endeavours to get to break even, but first responsibility deliver the plan. So it's like a stretch target and a basic target, Absolutely. in which case I sort of feel our language should be around the stretch target rather than, because if everybody starts just saying, oh, well, we're not going to, I mean, I think it's, I can see it's risky, we're going to make it anyway. But people shouldn't be comforting themselves that we're going to do 18.2 deficit mm -hmm. because actually zero deficit is what will be important for things like, um, I, I don't know, various things that are conditional upon us getting our house in order. So maybe uh, we could think about the language on it, because otherwise it is tempting to sort of think, oh yes, it's going to be done. So, so 
two, two things if I may. So, so, so first of all, hear, hear what you say about the language, so I think how we can reflect that, but also just to say that there was nothing about this report that was intended to be comforting. So this is not saying we've got an 18.2 million deficit and we're comfortably on course to, to, to deliver it. The, 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 the assurance that I would want the board to hear is that we are still working very hard across the system, individually and collectively, to bring some further action to bear on the significant financial risk that there is there. But we are absolutely not there yet. But there are several months of the year left, hence we are still forecasting that we will be able to get there. But I certainly didn't intend there to be comfort and don't want there to be false comfort. No, I got less comfortable as I read through it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Sheila, I'd like to come so back. So I'm just going to come back on the because back, back, again, that, that's um, uh, kind of ambiguity I guess around what is what is it we're, we're heading for is um, it's just, there's a lesson in this for us for next year's plan I think because as I understand it uh, the last finance committee I think we heard that that plan of 18.2 million deficit hasn't been approved and actually is our plan as far as the uh, as NHS England is concerned so I think we need to not have that ambiguity yeah. when we do next year's plan. I think we need to have a plan that is signed off by the region so that we're all quite clear. So we'll, if we hit the 18.2 million, we will be regarded as having failed, um, yeah. won't we? Um, uh, because um, we're supposed to get to break even. Yeah, the, the, again, the, the, the point is understood and, um, and well made. I mean, I, the, the responsibility is to, live, to deliver the plan. So, so, so the, the, it, it would be short of expectation, but, but I think if we can deliver the plan, that, that would be acknowledged as the best we could have done in, in, in this year. So, so, so I, to try and clarify some of that ambiguity, I think that has to be our, our first focus. And just to clarify, it, 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 that is held by the RD and RD, well, Devon. Um. It, 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 it is, yeah. yeah. So, so, the, so the, the, um, the makeup of the plan is set out in the, in the tables of, of, of the report. If we can't make any further progress on it, then it would manifest with the um, RD. Thank, Thank you very much, Sheila. Um, Thank you. I think it's a great report, and I do understand, I have my pragmatic side, and I recognise the importance of delivering a plan that's a small percentage of our overall income. However, I would like to see us being far more explicit about the trade-offs between delivering the plan and what we're losing by delivering the plan. Um, so at the moment, we're sort of talking about twiddling with existing things or with, with, with bits of income. You sort of said once we start running out of the one-off income, it starts to get a bit more difficult. But I, I, in a way, and I mean, I guess it's it's too early days because without having kind of clear strategies, but, you know, I'd like to know, I sense, because of my work on the health inequalities side, there's a lot we could do on health inequalities, but we just know we can't afford to because there isn't enough in the income stream to do that. And there's no way we're going to start shifting resources away from this into that. So I, that, for me, is a loss. And I'd like to be explicit about it. Um, I'd similarly like to be explicit about, about uh, you know, I think we really need to do something about citizen empowerment and communication and have a really ambitious plan about that. So I'd like that costed and I'd like that in there. <laughs> this is not what we're, what we're not doing. So I'm just wondering if our narrative allows us to be much more explicit about our trade-offs. And the other trade-off, which I think is incredibly important, is we know our staff are under intense pressure. And I, I'm not sure that cutting bits here, there and everywhere is actually going to address like, how do we do that? How do we address that? So, so I, 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 I don't know if it's possible within the narrative, but I would like us to be very, very clear that, yes, we're doing what our external accountability requires us to do, but it means that we can't do this. And that, to me, is really important to, as a statement of our autonomy, actually, mm -hmm. and our ambition. Thank you for that, Gina. Tracy. I think a theme of, of today has been um, that tension that we're holding between short-term efficiencies, how do we just get money out of the system, 
and long-term ambition mm -hmm. and sustainability of the system mm -hmm. and being able to demonstrate that because um, we want to do the right things for our communities in Devon. We absolutely want it to move forward and that sense of um, transformation programmes, big changes and what those changes will bring both to outcomes for people but also to financial stability of this system because just going from one year to the next always with um, this pressure as it is and you know, I'm, not, I'm not naive we will always be under pressure but I think there's something about um, understanding and, and how we, we might set in context this longer term direction which actually gives us some hope quite frankly that instead of having lines which is about pay and lines that are around things that are just efficiencies that actually there's something here which is about vision strategy and yeah. um, delivery of that vision and strategy and change in the system which gets us to a point of um, more sustainable sustainability yeah. thank you i think graham wants to come back on well uh, as you can say, and that's why i think we need to do the analysis of how much of this is recurring versus non-recurring because if if we're going to, as it were, make our numbers by non-recurring one-offs, that would suggest that we have not positioned ourselves for the long-term future. And I think in the Finance Commission we did indeed ask to see that, didn't we? Um, to make sure that we are indeed putting some things in place that are recurring. Thank you. Frank. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, this is the very naive question from the clinician who doesn't do much accounting apart from his own business. Businesses running two billion pound budgets don't always try and hit zero at the end of the year. They will carry deficits forward, and we're having to do this um, because we're told to do it. And it goes to what Sheen and Tracy are talking about. There is there's a lot of risk in all of this, and you know we could turn around and say actually we need to put four billion pounds into the Cavell sector because actually that's where they have the big point is. And, and we're not going to try and do it. Now, This the, the naivety is, it seems like we are possibly doing the wrong thing because that's what the masters are telling us to do when, when actually we should be trying to say we can't make all those cuts at this point in time because X, Y and Z are, are really very important to, to Devon. I'm not saying it's a Cavell Centre, but it, you know, do we have any leeway? Do we have any autonomy? Or do we just have to chase money? We're saying that we're going to get credibility and ability to do stuff if we get out of soft or I suspect next year target will be another, you've got to save this amount of money. And uh, it just feels like there's a lot of risk out there. There's a lot of people not getting things done. There's a lot of people actually dying as a consequence of us not sorting the system out, getting efficiencies in there clinically. Um, you know, when it takes months and months to get a CT scan report, and then they come in and they're positive for cancer, you know, that's not good. Mm -hmm. and so, so as we drive this, there are significant risks to our population. Thank you. Sheen, um, did you want to come back on that point? Um, mm -hmm. Before we jump back in, a more generic, more generic point. So, John, do you want to respond on that first thing? Yeah. Only to say. You know, Acknowledge the, acknowledge the difficulty, but um, it is a constraint. So, so, so money is a constraint, and we are expected to deliver services to the population within the allocation for, for, for the population, which is you know, a share of and, and a fair share, by the way, of, of what's available for um, for the NHS nationally. So, it is a really difficult but non-negotiable. Now, we've we've already pushed the envelope a little bit to the, to the tune of, of, of 18 million and, and um, that sort of reflects how difficult it was to, 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 to get a balance but uh, but we are and will continue to be expected to deliver balance in each and every year whilst we go through the bigger scale change that, um, that, that we talked about quite a lot to, today because we certainly won't get to something more sustainable without some of that bigger change. But that that expectation and constraint is not going to go away um, in in the same way you might be able to manage it through through business if you uh, if you have the cash. Thank you. 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 Th
But as Tracy said, we've been in this sort of deficit forever. And unless we fundamentally do something different, it's not going to change. Could I just, sorry, just very brief. I just, I just want to, to be clear. I, I am absolutely, I get that we have got a constrained budget. I think what I'm advocating for is that long, the pace at which we do the long-term mm. system change that enables us to have a system that is the right system for us that can actually flex uh, when, you know, if money becomes available, it flexes. When it, you know, when you haven't got the money, it has to bear down on, its, on itself. But it's a very different thing to every time going through line by line saying what salary, you know, who can you cut and what can you, you do. So I suppose it's it's just a slight difference of I'm, I absolutely, the, the constraint is there. Now I'm conscious of what Julie wants to come in and Liz and Greg. Were either of you, any of you wanting to respond on this particular point before we move on to another subject? Mine does Mine does Well, let me, let me bring Judy in um, next time. Well, I, uh, actually, what everyone's saying, but Graham's a point about we should look at our money overall and say, how do we want our money to be used? So it's not quite where are we now and how do we change it? But also Kevin's point about it's actually 4% that we're talking about. It isn't, Ira. I used to teach people budget management in healthcare by asking them to think about their domestic budgets. And we do this all the time in our domestic budgets. As your children become teenagers, you stop spending on things you used to do when they were younger because you want to spend on things that are appropriate as they get older. And I'm just not sure whether we've done enough of the, are, where are the areas where we're still spending, which frankly we don't need to do anymore because they're not, we, we had that whole session on doing treatments that we shouldn't be doing, but just, just, and maybe it's happening and I don't know, but as part of this resetting the whole thing, are we doing that um, good housekeeping, I suppose, thing of what do we no longer need to spend on? And I think we're always talking about trade-offs between nibbly cuts and not doing equalities or not doing another of the developments. But actually, there might be some areas where we could take 10% out because actually what we're doing there is no longer needed in the same way. Quite big sums of money. So I don't know how you do that across the system. I leave it with what you. But I think that idea would fit with Graham's idea of a, okay, how do we want our budget allocated to these different things? I think that's why we were going to look at the value-based approach to yes. look at where we are perhaps needing to make adjustments to what yeah. we're funding. Um, this. Thank you. I just want to remind us that a number of the drivers for strategic change aren't just about the money. Actually, we know that we've got some critical issues around workforce sustainability and creating jobs that people want to do and attract them into the Southwest, and also ensuring that we've got resilient clinical services. And the fact it's getting those two things right often will be the answers to some of the problems around the money. And often we'll get into conversation and think about it from a money perspective, but actually it's bigger than that. And actually, it's probably the route into solving the financial problem. Good. Thank you. Uh, so the, the way money flows to us tends to put it into two buckets, uh, capital and revenue expenditure, Cedar and Ardell. But actually within the revenue, I think it's probably worth us all really thinking through, there's really two types of expenditure. <coughs> there's a pure revenue expenditure going out on services and, and its associated infrastructure. But there's investment and uh, I know it's quite hard to capture it, but the whole point about investment is it's something that you're you're doing now for future benefit. And the question is, how long is it before you get that future benefit flowing back back to us? And I guess what I'd be really keen to do is understand how much are we investing for future benefit and can we justify that? Is it enough or is it is it um, yeah, too much actually? But I don't get a sense of the scale of how much we're really putting in now accepting that it's adversely affecting our finances, but we're doing it because it's going to have a longer term benefit. And what are those benefits? So at some point, I think we do need to have a sensible conversation about not capital deployment, which is a challenge in itself, but how much are we investing for improvement? And how much are we prepared to put aside? Because there might be some quite tricky trade-offs actually within that Ardell, which is how much is it going to services versus how much do we really need to put aside? For that future benefit. 
Right. So I think taking forward, we should probably, for one of our development sessions, be looking in much more detail at that and then doing a deep dive into how, mm -hmm. how we're spending our money and what mm -hmm. the value is. So thank you for that. Um, could I um, ask a question as well, if I may, John, um, about the, um, the ESRF performance risk? Because I noticed that we're ahead of activity um, for our ICB commissioned activity, but we're significantly behind for the NHSE commissioned activity. And, uh, and, and obviously they're then combined to give us the, uh, the, the total amount between them. But um, where do you see us being able to make progress on the NHSE commission part where we're, we're actually significantly behind? So the, the, the NHC commission part refers mainly, if not exclusively, to, to um, the more specialised end yes. services. And, and, and the issue there is, is, a, is, um, is about available capacity. So, so, so where it's constrained because of pressure on urgent on care in particular, yeah. then it to make the progress we would want to. So that, that's the key barrier. I just wanted that's to check where the key barrier was because otherwise the activity can go into day case type um, approaches, but that's where we're the, mostly the, the, having the, the challenge. The constraint is very much the, 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 the pressure in the urgent care system, which is squeezing out that particular part of that. Thank you. Great. Are there any other questions for John on the report? No. Thank you very much. This is very clearly presented. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate that. So we're coming on to now the next section, which is Andrew Millwood um, on the priorities and strategic objectives. Um, thank you, Andrew. Yeah, thank you, Chair. So um, uh, in your pack um, on page 59, and I don't know, Jody, if it's possible just to share that on the screen for colleagues to see, um, we had a, a really useful session, as you'll be aware, last time around um, the importance of, of us being really clear about our strategic objectives for 22-23. And basically what we've got there, Ginny and I took away all of the comments that you made at the session we had um, so that we could summarise really um, uh, all of the objectives that we would have. And, and the way we've done it, uh, and actually we've been testing this with, um, with lots of colleagues over the past uh, three to four weeks, including yesterday at ICS executives, is highlighting, I think, the conversation we had around having some priorities uh, or objectives around improving services. And clearly we've had a lot of discussion around those today around rebalancing some of our priority areas like the focus on health inequalities and a bigger shift to prevention. Then there's the orange area, the third area, which is around using our resources efficiently, given we're part of the soft process, um, how we utilise our workforce, make use of things like digital and, uh, and obviously look at the green and sustainable agenda. And then on the last column is some of the cultural things that we talked about that we want to change so how we operate how we create stronger relationships across um, one devon and then uh, being clear on our operating model and the way that we do business so i think uh, it's fair to say that actually people have welcomed having something that's so simple and so clear I think where we find ourselves at the moment is obviously people have got different views about whether these are right or wrong, even though um, these were part of our conversation. So I think it's fair to say most people from the feedback we've had, um, I think, uh, welcome sort of the three to the right. So from rebalancing our priorities, uh, resources and culture, I think people feel they're really clear. Um, they know what we're going to be focused on as a board. I think the area, and I've had some really useful feedback from Frank uh, in this area on the service side and from Sheena, is, um, and I'm sure they'll say a little bit more themselves about what some of their uh, comments are, is I think they feel we might want to do a little bit more work around the service area. So I think Frank, I think, highlighted that the focus shouldn't just be on urgent emergency care, but also on planned care. And I think Sheena's view, um, if I can just summarise, was probably should we even take a step back from just looking at these acute areas and have just something that's a bit more strategic that that, that joins up many of the services like acute primary care, mental health, etc. So I think for me, it would be good to just get 
um, some more steerage from colleagues about whether this is on the right lines. Uh, other groups feel, feel it is, whether we should be adjusting some of these, because I, I think these are really going to be important for us going forward because they'll set for people clarity on what we're really focused on as a board. And indeed, we've started to use these as an exec team to make sure that we're very focused on how we would deliver some of these and make changes. And they're part of our priority setting session that we've we've had one of those sessions and we've got another one on the 4th and 5th of October. So I think continual guidance and steward from colleagues, Chair, I think would be welcome. But this is where we've got to so far. Right, thank you for that introduction. So just to open it out to a wider discussion. Yeah, Tracy. Um, so, Andrew, thank you ever so much. And, and what's really good is the language is really straightforward. So um, I appreciate the be some word tweaking and, and so on, but I think the language is really straightforward. So coming back to um, the roadmap and the jigsaw puzzle of what this whole system looks like, I suppose I'm I'm thinking strategic objectives. Are they our prior? Is this just is this the set of priorities for us as a board for next year? And a set of strategic prior uh, objectives would be the things we'd have in our strategy rather than, I just want the language to be, and I, maybe I'm misinterpreting it. I, I, I don't disagree with anything in here. And actually, I think it's about the focus for the board. My question is, how does that fit with the world that is being created or the system that is being created and how this fits in with, with the system? Because the worst thing is when we have a set of priorities, objectives here, and then there's another set over there, and then there's a third. And we'll go, I don't know where, which, what, what am I working to? So it, for me, it's just about how this fits into the bigger picture. Thank you for that. And I know Sheena and Jane would like to come in as well. Sheena, do you want to go in? Yeah, oh, I'm Tandy, yes. I, I, don't, I don't have a huge problem with the boxes, all of which makes sense. I'm, I'm sort of thinking that there's a distinct, we possibly need to make a distinction between what is a strategic objective, what is a mechanism to achieve that strategic objective, and what might be what we see at the end of it all, the decision in terms of the outcomes. So I, I, I was thinking when I sent an email yesterday, I was actually thinking about the old quadruple aim. The triple aim has gone up to a quadruple aim now. And that seems to me to be quite a good set of four strategic objectives. So just to remind myself, it's about um, improving population health and reducing inequalities is number one. So that kind of takes us into the prevention end and the inequality thing. Um, the second one is improved experience of care. I quite like seeing it in the round rather than dividing it out to these silos of acute mental primary. I think that care is an integrated experience for most people because they're not, you know, it's about their care journey depending on where they are. So I, I like the idea of joining it up. Um, the third one is improved experience of care um, in terms of, sorry, the, is the healthcare team well-being including that of the carers? So it brings the workforce issue in. And the fourth one is lower system costs. So I think, I mean, that, that's a kind of well-used quadruple aim globally, which would make sense for me as aims. But then I'd see other things coming in as well. What are the enablers? Well, the enablers are having a workforce strategy. The enablers are, are actually planning our resource, you know, usage and, and, and modelling and doing proper data management. I mean, I can't, I can't see what else is on this thing. But, so, I mean, it's, it's not a huge criticism. It's just a sort of different way of seeing it. But I, I probably would like to see it more in kind of logic model terms. You know, so I can see the journey and I can see what our aims are, what our interventions are and how we measure where we're getting in terms of both short term outcomes and longer term outcomes. So you could then sort of say, well, actually, the reason we, we plausibly believe by doing this and seeing some interim outcomes with regard to this, we will see an increase in life expectancy. We will see a decrease in, in ACEs and the sorts of things that are important to us, but we never have on our strategic map. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Tandy, I'm going to bring you in next and then Jane to comment on this. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with the two um, speakers, Tracy in particular, about um, this needing, this is very clear and uh, I think a lot more faster to absorb and assimilate. But I think that we also need to be thinking about the many staff on the ground that need to absorb all this information and to be clear in their heads what they're working to or what they're working towards um, by the time we get to, to to that space. So I think I would um, agree that um, we need to sort of define it properly. What, what, what space does it occupy in the bigger system? But also, I suppose, with the ICP 
about to engage um, in the wider strategy. I think those two things also need to talk in parallel because we don't want to create a set of objectives here and then the, the ICP one looks slightly different or uses slightly different languages. I think we can get a bit confused in the end, but I like it. It's it's very simple. Thank you. Um, could I, just before I bring you in, Jane, is just comment that on the first box for improving services, uh, we, we agreed that we're going to talk about urgent and emergency care um, as being one of our key priorities because it encompassed so much as a pathway right through from prevention um, through to actually delivery. So I wonder, the way we're phrasing it is just about delivering urgent care services perhaps misses the opportunity to make it a wider point about improving the outcomes and experience of people um, uh, uh, but actually bringing in the prevention aspect as well. I just wondered if we need to just slightly tweak that language because it looks like we're just focusing on A&E um, rather than the, the wider uh, issues around it. Um, Jane. Um, Thank you. I, I mean, it's quite tricky to capture this. And, and the way I see it, and I think the point's been made, is that there is something a little bit about the, the in-year delivery. And um, and I think your point, we can, I think now, Sheena, align this to the enablers. And I think certainly the logic model, I uh, I totally agree. So, um, but this is, this is, this has to also, we also then have to build the sort of longer term vision piece as well. So the intention is, and the way I see it, this is sort of in year, obviously we're not necessarily going to solve everything in year, but at least it sort of gives us that focus. Um, in terms of the language, I mean, cancer's not there. So you would say, oh, we're, you know, so I think there's a bit of um, making it so that it's, it covers the breadth of what we need. And I take your point about urgent emergency care because, um, that shouldn't just be about um, a and &E, it's about the whole wide of pathway. So maybe we need to talk, I mean, we've talked before about use of pathways, so I think we try to avoid pathways, but actually how to articulate that. So, I, I mean, it's a bit like, and I think the point about the strategic objectives piece is, is a good one. So I suppose what we just need, I think, is be a bit pragmatic about having something that we can just, um, and as, as we've discussed previously, we will be reviewing some of this, but at least it helps focus because um, it helps people focus, otherwise it's sometimes quite difficult for teams and others to see the wood for the trees. So I think, I think um, um, uh, yeah, and it feels like we need to do another piece as part of the ICP, which is the sort of the, uh, well, what, what's good going to look like in five to 10 to 20 years. So, uh, I yet again agree with Sheena, I think. <laughs> um, but um, not all of these objectives are of the same type. And I think I'm not being just being semantic, but I'm not sure the tableau format is the right way of looking at it. I think it's much more about a pyramid. And the pyramid is what things are enabling to build to the things that you really want to achieve. And I think if we started thinking about the relationship between these, it would give us a little bit more nuance around where the priorities are to do things to deliver. So in this tableau format, I'm not quite sure does it for me. It's a great start, and I don't disagree with it. I think we could evolve it to something if we're using it as a communication and engagement tool, which I think we are, then I think maybe a different imagery might work better for us. Right. So I'm just wondering what, where we need to, do we actually have to agree, um, Andrew, anything today, or are you happy to take that away? And, um, and I'm, I'm happy to, to take it away. I think, I think for me, uh, Sometimes the terminology of, of objectives don't help because I think people have a different view, don't they, about what's an objective, what's a priority. I think these are areas of focus for the board for the for the year ahead. Um, I'm, I wonder whether we just use terminology that's even clearer. Um, I'm happy to do a little bit of more work uh, with Ginny around it and perhaps share with with some of the colleagues who are on our smaller group to see if we can get to a place. I think for me these are really important. I think the quicker we can you know, sort of get them done and make sure people are clear, certainly for our staff. I think it's always really helpful to have things like this in place uh, so they know what our areas of focus are. So um, I'm happy to do some um, to reshaping of it. I mean, I suppose I wouldn't want 
I mean, I sort of feels that's quite important that we do endorse the direction of travel and the majority of it rather than starting yes. again because it does drive a lot of other things. And yes. we're noticing in papers, even we've got gaps where we haven't got a, so I suppose going to be I'm quite pragmatic if we could. So, you know, with, with the, and I think actually Graham's point about that interrelationship, it could be done differently. But if in general we could agree that this, you know, with some mm. further shaping, that would help enormously. <laughs> Great. Um, Ginny, I'm going to bring you in. Yeah, just to quickly add to that, to, to reinforce what Jane's saying in terms of risk management, which I think we've all agreed is, you know, real priority, we need to get things sorted out. Actually, in order to get that framework around risk management, we need to know what it is we're trying to achieve so we can say what the strategic risks are. So actually, this is this is a very first building block in order to, in order to be able to get that done. So we, we do need to get a kind of a fairly sort of pragmatic decision on are these good enough for now so we can get that, that framework built. Yes, and, and just to... <coughs> <laughs> this is the set in stone. They yeah. can be adapted as we yeah. go forward. Um, and now I'm, I'm conscious that we've got quite an agenda to get through. And having we were ahead of time at one point, but we're now not. Um, so uh, we do have to, to finish on time for a number of members have to leave. Are there any other burning points? Because if not, can we very quick then, Gina? Um, Andrew, if you want any help in setting it up as a logic model, which puts these interrelationships in together, I'm very happy to help. It's entirely up to you. I don't want to impose myself on you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Right, so now we're going to come on now to our assurance committee updates and escalations, and that's starting with you, Graham. Okay, thank you. So, uh, um, two things I wanted to raise. Um, one, one is I think we should all be conscious of the capacity within the governance team, and uh, it's doing a fabulous job for the resources that we've got in it, but we are down. And I think that one of the consequences of that is that the risk piece is indeed something we haven't really tackled yet. And I'm aware that orders and risk should be particularly um, on top of um, the adequacy of a risk management process. Um, and at the moment, uh, to be honest, I, I don't think we're there. Um, and as a consequence of that, the risks that are being packaged out to the various committees probably aren't taking uh, the performance that they need to do. So I think we're aware that we do indeed need to bring that to the board when there is capacity in time to do so. That's point one. And the second thing is just to pick up on the uh, statutory audit um, and just to expand on my slight amendment to minutes. Um, we remain without an audit firm, and Johnny might be better actually to talk about that. Uh, it's in the works, but it is um, not um, just us. I actually have seen the data as of yesterday. There are 16 foundation trusts that don't have auditors in place either for this year. Do you want to just update us briefly on yeah. where we are? Just an update. So, so um, the, 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 the issue for us particularly has arisen with the transition from CCGs to newly formed ICBs, which has created an issue for a number of uh, ICBs across the country, but particularly in the, in, in the southwest. We are having a, uh, as ICBs in the southwest are having a joint conversation with um, with the audit market um, about what the, the, the right <coughs> solution would be for that. So I would expect to be in a position to update the audit committee on the, on a recommendation very shortly. Thank you. Yeah. And we've delegated authority to yeah. your committee yeah. to make that decision. Yeah. So thank you very much for that update. Any questions at all for Graham? Well, thank you very much, Graham. Really much appreciated. Right, so we're going to come on now to Judy and the Primary Care Transition Committee. Okay. Just a re reminder to people that the reason we have a Primary Care Committee is that commissioning was delegated for primary care to CCGs from the regions and... Uh, they are, that was for general practice, and they're about to delegate dental, optometry, and pharmaceuticals. So it's treated slightly differently, but we're working in the best way we can to make sure that it then fits within decision making on everything else. The big issue I wanted to just comment on, because the report is from our meeting in July, we didn't have one in August, is the what we've been calling the strategy for primary care but is in a sense a framework for making sure that primary care is really as fully developed as we can help it to be for this 
vision of care that we have for out-of-hospital care, all the stuff we were talking about this morning when we were talking about um, the challenges for emergency care and, and so on. Um, and there has been some, what has been a new word to me, but socialization of this strategy. <laughs> and um, there have been some concerns expressed. Uh, one was that it was working in isolation, absolutely no way. Um, it's very much intended to be part of the whole out-of-hospital package. Uh, another, that it wasn't ambitious enough, and it's very clear that the document did not well enough describe how important it was to us that general practice is working in a way which builds on local networks, primary care networks that have a geographical focus that fit with the out of sorry, the healthcare, the population management module model. So there's some work to be done to um, keep us building on what I actually think was during COVID some really amazing development in primary care, some real coming together in a way that practices hadn't in the past. Um, but I just wanted to reassure people that this was not about treating primary care separately. It was about helping it be ready for this fuller role in out-of-hospital care, which as these extra roles for primary care networks get implemented, they will be in a much stronger position to develop. Sorry, that's it. Thank you. Sheila, um, I've got a question. I've got two questions, Judy. Um, the one is with regard to with the move towards out-of-hospital care, um, and I think that the, the digital health technology is going to be really, really important here. Um, the, the kind of information I've had from the digital side is that although general practices have the infrastructure to use remote monitoring and a whole set of things, they actually do have the electronic patient records to do that, which not possible to do, but they're not using it. So do we have a strategy to, to really accelerate the, the, the confidence and skill in using digital? If we don't, should we? And my second question is about dental because I get the impression that it's just gone completely private and inaccessible to the vast majority of people. And, and if it's part of our commissioning responsibility, what, what's the plan? So on digital, um, we had uh, a really excellent digital transformation program with some really good support to practices and patients around um, um, using this new digital system. And Devon was the leading or one of the leading systems in the country on doing that. Uh, during COVID, uh, people built on that, um, and our model was used to help other areas on digital support for practice development and for practices. I can't answer your question as of today. I do know that the uh, stuff that came out from the Secretary of State about being able to see your GP in person um, all those percentage statistics that implied that if you had a lower number of face-to-face, -face, you were not a good practice. And we did a lot of work to ameliorate that so that it wasn't just a blunt statistic. Remember during the Daily Mail no, campaign? Yeah, I absolutely agree. It's, it wasn't so, actually about remote consultations or even booking um, appointments or booking prescriptions. I was talking about it's something quite different. It's about being able to monitor someone who's in their home using things like oh, wearables. And okay, things okay, like that. that kind Which of Which if we're moving towards the, I mean, I don't know who's going to be doing this, but effectively it might be a sort of central ICD clinical multidisciplinary team. It might be the GP who's okay. the care coordinator. But I'll make we sure that out, yeah. we double pick that up. I mean, it is intended and we've been working with the LNC on the word is going to ox oximeters and other yeah. things like that. So I'll, I'll pick that up too. And the other point you made about dental, well, I read my first report on dental yesterday, and I'm pretty horrified. It isn't technically in our books yet. It comes from the 1st of April. But, uh, well, probably from the 1st of April. James looking a bit, maybe, maybe not. But we're being, we're being, we're being groomed to be ready to take it on the 1st of April. And... Uh, what I've just agreed with Joe Turl, who leads on primary care and out of hospital care, is that we will take each of the three areas, mm -hmm. dental, optical, pharmaceutical, 
in depth at our next three meetings. Uh, but there's no doubt that the transactional approach to contracting, which regions have adopted, makes for absolutely no nurturing of a service. And over the last three to five years, we've tried to nurture general practice, and we've seen some real improvements as a result of doing that. And I think we probably need to adopt some of the same approaches um, because these, uh, with the other three, because these services are so isolated and in terms of their business and the way that their contracts have been held with them in the past, but actually in terms of their importance to us and the integration of services, they shouldn't be isolated at all. They are absolutely part of integrated care for our patients. I think, Nigel, you want to respond to this, and then I can bring Liz in. So um, it was just, so John McCormick, who sits with the group of Malcolm, and um, he's at our sort of digital need for primary care, very interested yeah. in this, so I'm very happy to make that direct connection. Um, I know you sit on one of the groups. It was actually him who said that they've got the infrastructure but they're not using it. Yeah, so, so, yeah. so okay. we're very happy to pick that up, John. And the dental thing, um, it's only the CMO group of all of, all of the Southwest um, uh, CMOs and systems have raised that with NHS England. Our concern about dental things, okay. um, which we've asked to raise with Steve Parson, is dental lead. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to really welcome the, the work that's been done. I think we all acknowledge that we talked a lot today, aren't we, about the pressures within the secondary care system, but I think we also need to acknowledge those significant pressures in primary care and actually the, the quality of provision and the experience that's been reported by people using those primary care services. Um, so the strategy as it stands at the moment, I think, is a really positive step forward. I think as a secondary care provider, one of the things I'm really keen to think a bit about is how do we jointly anticipate needs for the future, recognising things are changing, and think about how we might use the opportunities of collaboration through things like primary care networks and our integrated offer to, um, to kind of plan for our future and anticipate it. So I think this feels like a really important step forward, um, but want us to keep that journey kind of in progress. And I think it's really important that we test some different models, mm -hmm. and we may need to get permission to do some of our contracting in slightly different ways. I've already asked Simon what the rules are now and will we be able to, so that we can test different models and test them properly, not just six months here or a year there. <coughs> These different models, a period of time to develop with staff on contracts that are meaningful, not a six months job here and so on. Thank you. Um, Frank, did you have a Just um, three quick things. In terms of strategy, I, I, I know a lot of people wanted to tell primary care what it's going to be in the future. I think this strategy actually allowed them to, to step into the space rather than tell them. So 122 sovereign organisations that, that if you say you've got to be big, they're going to say, no, we're not. So um, it, it, if you're outside primary care, it looks like it's, it's not very ambitious. If you're inside primary care, actually it does allow you to to think differently, behave differently, and do things differently. Um, in terms of digitalization, primary care moved really, really quickly or, uh, as soon as we were allowed to. Um, we, uh, you know, I use it the whole time. I've, I've sent thousands of texts to patients, have photos back, stop them having to have appointments, send them on. Um, they, they send in their, their blood pressure results. Have we systematized it? Um, not yet, but we could very easily. And primary care actually uses it a lot. The dental issue and taking on the commission I'm really concerned about. I went to the LDC meeting um, last week. Um, there are 179 practices in Devon. There's 124 taking on NHS patients. There is no one taking on new NHS patients. So as everyone moves from their dentist, they will not be able to get an NHS dentist anywhere in Devon. So, you know, if you think of the armed forces community, families come down, they can't get a dentist. It's impossible. So taking on the, the, the commissioning of it is going to be quite a challenge. But I, I went, I'm going to go to those meetings just so I start to understand their world as I'm, I'm a primary care I'm a partner member. Thank you. Thank you for that. So if there's no other question on that, thank you very much, Judy, for thank your you. report. And we'll come on next to Tandy. Excuse um, me. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um,
which I know Judy you mentioned you have to leave, but thank you for your report. So we're going to come on now to the um, the people, culture and workforce strategy committee. Thanks, Sarah. So um, the People and Culture Committee met for the first time last month. So we are at the very beginning of uh, putting that um, committee together. And I think this committee in particular, unlike the rest of the other ones, we are sort of going to evolve with what the whole system is about, um, given that we're looking at people and that's a cross-cutting uh, issue that's relevant to quality, to finances, organizational development and all those things. So we spent a lot of time um, trying to sort of work out the scope and the framework within which the, the committee itself is going to um, operate just so we're sure that we're all on the same page. We also looked at workforce um, statistics and I think across the day we've been looking at all sorts of data and statistics about uh, where things are at. Um, but on this particular one, we're looking at the workforce um, statistics. Um, so in terms of turnover, vacancy rates, cost of staff, um, staff absence. Um, and in particular, we also sort of looked at the issue of social care and um, the fact that the data in the social care world is not really um of, well, it's not really being presented in the same way as what we're looking at in terms of the, the acute um, data, but we're sort of working to make sure that those two things um, come together so we have a full picture of what's happening in terms of staff. And obviously on the social care one as well, we, we sort of realise that that's the point at which there's a grey space in terms of how that sector can actually feed in into the acute sector to make sure that some of the issues we're complaining about in terms of patients staying too long and not being able to leave the acute system, how those two things uh, work together there. So uh, we, we recognise that there's a lot of um, thinking that will need to be done there as well as um, sort of work to bring in new staff in social care. Um, and so we also looked at the workforce strategy. So the workforce strategy is in draft now um, and hopefully should be finished not too long from now, but the draft is there, um, clearly um, giving the priorities there that we have, uh, which includes, you know, learning and development um, as well as building workforce capacity and being sure that we can uh, respond to all the issues that you've raised today. Um, but that means that we are going to have some level of thinking around system redesign to uh, fit into all these things that we've been talking about today. Uh, I think the key challenge is the culture bit. Um, how are we going to get people within the system to work um, as if they're part of the system rather than just part of their individual um, organisation? So there's another piece of work that's evolving to respond to uh, system design uh, working, and that should feed in into our forward planning for the um, uh, committees and meetings coming up forward. So that's all I have to update today. Thank you, Tandy. Does anyone have any um, questions for Tandy? Or was there anything you wanted to add as well from your perspective of workforce? Yeah, just to say, particularly on the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the workforce strategy. So we've we've had a set of principles agreed a few months ago. There's a lot of work uh, that's happening as we speak, and we'll conclude at the back end of the financial year in, in terms of um, getting agreement as to what the size and shape of the workforce needs to be for kind of you know five years time and that's not just with sovereign organizations it's kind of cross-cutting in terms of you know service lines as well so we're doing a sort of matrix of work at the moment um and um i've been really clear that you know we, we need to understand um in some detail as to where we see the kind of shifts of, of skill mix needing to be because there is no point in having a, a plan that's kind of predicated on trying to find a workforce that you, you know, can't afford or, or can't find. So we're going to be really challenging of ourselves and partners to say, actually, you know, we can't carry on this this growth because say we can't afford it and we can't find them. Uh, and to be really specific about where we see the shift in skill mix um, occurring, because we, we look back and we've seen where our growth has been. Um, and that's that's been great from lots of points of view, but you know, going forward, that's you know, it's not sustainable. So, by the end of the financial year, the, the, the plan is that we have something that's very specific about kind of future size and shape. 
once that's been agreed, there's a piece of work that's running concurrently, but we're running a bit slower in terms of a, a response, in terms of having a learning education strategy that allows you to deliver all of that. And, and you know, if I was a betting person, I'd say that um, there's it's very likely there'll be an investment needed. You know, so as a, for example, if we are going to want to have more advanced practitioners, which is the usual example I give in our system, uh, that doesn't come for free. So I'm, I'm anticipating there'll be a there'll be a need at some point for a, a kind of discussion about investment in, in the future of our workforce to allow that different skill mix to actually happen. And I think Judy, you had a point as well about um, pathways for care um, staff and whether we can have another piece of work there in terms of supporting people in that space to be able to see how they can move from what essentially, um, in my mind, is um, a job that really doesn't articulate very clearly where people can take themselves with once once they're in there, but how we can actually grow our own staff within Devon um, so that somebody, if they go into their care sector, they are able to see that there's actually a route, a pathway where they can, you know, end up being a nurse, for example. But that there's, there's going to be a lot of thinking to be done around that space. Thank you. And if Nigel, you wanted to come back and also Liz. So, so just to pick up that very last specific point, um, just before I started, there was a meeting that Devon County Council held just on that very point, a really exciting uh, meeting with colleagues thinking about just that, how you attract a workforce and then uh, you know, support those colleagues to build a portfolio and crossover hub. So I think there's, there's some work in that. Now, I was going to pick up the point that somebody made about the culture of these things, you, Tandy, that, that I think is so important to speak to Paul's point. And we're seeing some really great examples of how colleagues are working across the system already. So um, colleagues in Plymouth um, did some um, endoscopy work, um, which put some pressure on their waiting times, but they did it willingly and badly. And, and we were very keen to flag that as a, as a start of, of a process we'd like to explore. And then very happy to come and talk about some of that work that sits under the acute provider collaborative in terms of the sustainability and fragile services about how we're building a plan to approach that um, redesign um, of services candidate to your committee. Yeah, I think we, we, we also say that a part of this is going to be to obviously help people get into the culture of system working, but part of it is also going to be modelling and showing them that it actually works. So we might need to do smaller projects, pilots somewhere, and then be able to show the system that actually this is working and these are the benefits, and then maybe people might get into that system a little bit easier um, than just asking them to join it. Thank you. And um, Liz? A couple of points. I mean, first of all, it's really good to hear some of the developments because we talked a lot today about the importance of workforce and how we uh, support a sustainable workforce going um, forward. Um, having more people isn't always productive, and I think we've learned over the last couple of years that we've increased our workforce significantly. So I think there is a challenge for us around how do we rate and create the right conditions for our staff to, to be able to deliver um, productively. But I also want us to give some thought to talent and talent management and leadership development um, because that's going to be critical particularly in the context of the strategic change that we want to make and how we develop our people to lead in that space I think is also going to be very important. Thank you. Um, Sheena, you've just got three points. Um, the first is I suppose a, a, a clear suggestion to work um, more with the education providers. So for example Plymouth is now um, using interprofessional education kind of arguing that most people that we working in multidisciplinary teams, when they are qualified, they need to get some experience in that before they qualify. Um, and with regard to placement opportunities, I think that's really interesting because it gives you opportunities to run things that, with placement students who are supervised but free, okay, not completely free, but you know what I mean? I think there are just ways of actually liaising a little bit more earlier on the pipeline um, with regard to encouraging these students to think in slightly different ways. The second point is with my digital transformation hat on, which I think is part of my remit. Um, it, it is really about the digital skills training and the confidence training, because a lot of the obstacles, I think, to shifting towards, um, and, and this is going to be really important when we've got our EPRs in place, people need to be confident enough to know that this is not going to add to their workload, but it's going to be a way of actually reducing their workload, helping them to risk stratify, to manage their patients outside the hospital and things like that. And at the moment, I don't know if you find this in your hospital, but this, when I talk to clinicians, they just do an acting nurse talking to them on Saturday, he said, please don't give people wearables. And I'm kind of thinking, we've got to give them wearables. We've just got to manage the data properly. So I think we've, we've got to do some training, you know, our nurses, our doctors, they've really raised their confidence, and actually our care home staff as well. 
Um, and the third point is from the health inequality hatch on, um, that, that I, I, I think part of the community first strategy, isn't it, is, is really starting to deploy community assets and community capabilities much more. And I, I, I really support that, but I, I kind of am I'm impatient to get a move on with regard to it. Um, and I kind of want to know what the strategy is about that. And, and one of the things I think we need to do, this sounds very top down, because I know a lot of it should be about appreciative inquiry. But I think some of it's about top down public public broadcasting. You know, and you look at some of the, you know, and I think there are ways of doing it. You can see it on BBC with their ambulance program, which surely raises people's awareness about, you know, what paramedics are doing and, and, and the kind of pressures on them. A, a really triangulated and, and radical and interesting approach to putting together stuff for our citizens to say, look, this is what you can do to help your healthcare service. We all own this together. You know, this is what you can do to help the communities. I think would be brilliant, and it's the sort of thing we should be doing quicker because we know the pressures that we're under. So, unless I, I'd, I'd like to know what our plans are to really expedite the kind of harnessing of community assets. So, I bring I think back. Yeah, I think I, I agree with all of those points you've raised, Gina. Um, on the third point, um, I think don't forget that we've also got the ICP trying to work out the, um, the strategy um, in that sense. And I think it would be really good to get to a space where once that strategy from the ICP is completely done and, and, and dusted, then we can work out how to go big and get to the community about what it is we're asking them to do. And so we're not sort of, you know, seen as being here and there at the same time. So I, I think maybe it might just be an issue of sequencing. I don't know, but I absolutely agree with you that public engagement and involvement is absolutely going to be key here. I think we just need to decide when is the right time to actually go out and ask them to get involved. Is it now when we're still trying to get stuff sorted in our own heads or once we've moved on a little bit, I'm, I'm not very sure there. Thank you. Right. If we have no other questions or points. Uh, um, I think we're going to have Hisham was going to try and join us online for his presentation. Is, is, he, is he there, Jody? Um, I think he sent him um, a note on chat um, that he, he doesn't think he's going to be able to do that because he's on the train, but that um, people, he's, he's hoping everybody has read the report and that they might be able to send some questions to him. I, okay. I don't think he's changed that, but that's what I can see on chat. Unfortunately, I can't see the chat from where I am. So in that case, we will come to Kevin uh, next. Yeah. Darren, are you able to do uh, a <coughs> So I wasn't at the meeting, but I know Kevin was. Um, <laughs> that's probably the main point to raise, is obviously the continued... Yeah, no, I think, I think the main challenge to raise is the continued concerns around ambulance handovers, the unmitigated risk yes. into our communities and... I know Nigel has recently held a summit, so that is due to come back to the next quality group. Um, I think yeah, that remains a very, very hot topic of conversation within the wider quality and the impact on on performance, obviously, and the wider elements around that's the hospital flow. And yeah, it's a symptom of a much wider challenge. I think that's the main the main area that has been a conversation. I think the other area in terms of yeah, again, based on the data we've seen someone we have seen an increase in never events. As we've seen our elective activity start to increase, we have seen a, a number of never events, particularly around wrong site surgery. So it's an area of, of, of early concern that we will continue to work through within the quality group. And I think probably just to note here, obviously the integrated quality performance report is going through an iteration, and I'm sure Kevin might want to mention that as well. Um, it should be appended to the board papers, which it isn't. Um, so I think going forward, what we will to recognising that there will be a new report next month <coughs> to make sure that it is appended. But I think, again, making sure that I know that there is a conversation both within the quality group and, and up to the become finance and performance group around areas that we will almost then potentially want to escalate and potentially opportunity for, them for any further board conversation on those, those escalations so that we don't don't lose sight of the integrated quality and performance reports within the wider conversation, particularly within the, the public sector of this, this board. Can I just come back on the point about the um, the never events? I mean, it really is quite a significant jump. It doesn't yes. look like it's just noise. It's it, it's a very significant jump, um, which is very worrying because of the protocol that are supposed to be yeah. in place to stop that happening. 
what what it what's being done sort of right now to to try and address that so that we don't see that next time? Yeah, well? so we are working with each of the individual providers to understand some of the root causes behind it, even before we get to the, the full reports. Consequently, there have been five in the in the new new financial year, which is where we would expect to see in a whole whole year. Um, it looks that there are links between uh, wrong site surgery and procedures that happen outside of the normal surgical sort of theatre based, so procedure room type elements, interventional radiography, um, dermatology type environments. So there is an element around the, the, the local procedures around safety over the World Health Organization surgical checklist um, to make sure that we're adapting and, and adopting that in, in every particular area. So there have been some immediate actions taken. We're also working with NHS England because actually we're not alone in Devon um, and there seems to be a, a trend in, in other areas as well. So there will be a wider Southwest ICB sharing learning event to make sure that we can take some further learning out of this as well. Thank you. Nice. There is a phenomenon um, which is well known to the military that when people come back from a deployment, um, they are more likely to make errors like this, and um, certainly it's something that um, NHS were aware of as the pressures from the mm -hmm. pandemic. You know that people were under for such a long time eased. This this is not you know this is not. Um, it's not completely unexpected. One of the other things that the nuclear industry found at the end of the pandemic when they went back to doing their inspections was that when people weren't being kind of uh, inspected in the way they were, some of the procedures that Darren has mentioned went a bit lax. Mm -hmm. So I do wonder if there may be something for us with the CMO yeah. group just to, to re-rehearse some of that because um, as we approach winter and pressure comes again, and if some of the, and we know from some of the discharge work that you know, some of the policies and procedures and process just aren't quite as tight as perhaps they were once. Um, and we, and recognising people are tired and stressed, actually when you start making mistakes it, it, or errors, it, it, it causes additional work. So it's probably worth the conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Before hearing an update on that. Right, was there anything else that you wanted to add at this point or Kevin? No? Right, thank you very much. So we're going to move on then. Well, it is you, Kevin, next, because it's actually your report on uh, finance. Thank you. Um, okay, so, so we, we've actually met three times since the last board meeting. Um, so I'll take the report as read because there's quite a bit in there. But the issue that I did just want to um, report in to the board um, for, for minuting here, really, um, is around the, um, the business case for the Plymouth West End um, Health and Wellbeing Centre, which um, board members will recall we submitted to the uh, NHS England region uh, at the beginning of August. Um, NHSC then undertook what's uh, known as a fundamental criteria review of the business case, and that's now been completed. And uh, the outcome of that is that we've got a um, a lot of feedback on that business case across um, 35 categories um, and they've traffic lighted us on a kind of red, amber and green scoring against those 35 categories. So 16 of them are green, 18 of them are amber, there's one red. The one red, um, unsurprisingly, relates to capital affordability. Um, that's not much of a surprise to us um, because there's been a question mark over um, uh, whether or not that would still be available. Um, so where we are with this now is the door may not finally be closed on all of that. And so it's really good that we've got this uh, this feedback and um, from Manchester region. But um, the two things we need to do, I think one is that we um, I need to bring this into the finance committee uh, to start exploring um, alternative sources of capital if the NHS England capital wasn't available, uh, just what might be available to us as a kind of plan B financing scheme. And secondly, that we um, uh, look at all of the amber and green scores. Um, these, um, the feedback contains a large number of detailed actions um, which the regional team wants us to address and um, so what I would like to do in the next finance committee is um, have some feedback from uh, the executives uh, against each of those um, criteria uh, and the feedback that the, um, sorry, a response from the executives to the feedback against each of those criteria against which it's been assessed 
Um, and um, and then for us to oversee uh, the changes to uh, the business case that might be necessary uh, as a result of that feedback, so that should capital funding become available, that we're good to go immediately with the business case that satisfies the regional requirements. So I think that's all that I want to um, report in. Obviously, happy to answer any questions about anything else that's in the report. Thank you very much, um, Kevin. Did anyone have any points for Kevin? You, I think, already had quite a detailed um, financial report and extended discussion on that. So I think we'll thank you very much for the work that your committee are uh, continuing to do on the Cavell Centre project. Right. Well, I think that brings us to the end of the meeting. Um, I haven't seen any other public questions um, highlighted. Um, is there any other business that anybody would like to raise? No? Um, so just before we close the meeting, Jody, could you clarify the date of our next meeting so that we've got that implemented as well? Yeah, next uh, meeting is the 19th of October. That's at Pomona House in Torquay. This because we did agree that we would try and rotate round, so that's great. Thank you very much, uh, indeed, colleagues, for, for joining today and for everyone joining online. Bye-bye.